All right, now then, verse 15, brethren. Now always remember, Paul is writing to believers, in this case, Gentile believers up there in central Turkey, in what was then called Galatia. And he says, brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or can cancel it or add thereto. Now that sounds like double talk in a way, doesn't it? But see what the apostle is really saying, that as he himself is also human, he's a man like anyone else, and he has an understanding that the law, so far as humanity was concerned, was weak and beggarly. It just couldn't get the job done. And that sometimes shocks people. Because we ordinarily think of the law from the other side, and that is that it was what? Perfect, holy, righteous, and that it is. But from the man's point, from the human standpoint, it was powerless. And all it could do was point the finger of condemnation at mankind. All right? So, but since it is a covenant, a covenant in Scripture, remember, is always a one-way street. Every covenant in Scripture begins and ends where? With God, see? And men can't touch it. They can't enlarge on it. They can't subtract from it. And this is exactly what he was saying. Even though from a man's standpoint it is weak and beggarly, yet, now look at it again in verse 15, <clears throat> if it be confirmed, and we know it was, it was settled in heaven, that if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now, now let's move on to verse 16. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, and he saith not unto seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, that is, the seed of Abraham in this case, who is Christ. All right, now. And we call it the Abrahamic covenant. And I still maintain it's one of the most important portions of the whole Old Testament. And if you don't understand the Abrahamic covenant, the rest of the Bible is just sort of like a mist. You just can't see it clearly. But oh, once you get an understanding of this covenant, everything falls in place. All right, but don't forget the seed of the woman back there in Genesis. Verse 1 of chapter 12, Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that... Now I want you, if you haven't before, underline the I wills. Because whenever God says, I will, what is that? It's a promise, see? It's a promise. He's going to do it. And nothing in heaven or earth will ever stop him. And so he says, I will make, or I will show thee a land. Then verse 2, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great. I will bless them that bless thee. And you can put the verb back in. I will curse him that curseth thee. And in thee, again, you can put in the verb without any danger to Scripture, in thee I will bless all the families of the earth. Now, that's a bunch of promises, isn't it? That's a truckload. And all of this was promised to this one man. Now, on the surface, it doesn't seem that great. But listen. All of human history since 2000 B.C. is resting on these promises. And God has kept them. Every one of them. Abraham became, became a great man. He's still thought of as one of the great men of history. The, the scriptures uphold him as a great man. God blessed him and his progeny. And God has blessed those who bless Israel. He has cursed those who have cursed Israel. And you've... <coughs> Now, verse 16 again, that to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. The singular seed, Isaac, not the whole nation now, but the one man, Isaac, were the promises uh, made and the covenant is going to rest. 
And then he goes on to say in verse 16, He saith not as of seeds or many, but of one, one seed and one son, and that seed is Christ. And so this is why every one of us, regardless of where we are in human history, we are all benefiting from this Abrahamic covenant through whom all the world would be blessed. All right, now I think we can move on to verse 17. <clears throat> now Paul says, And this I say, that the covenant, the covenant, oh, that's an important word, you know, all through the Old Testament. The covenant that was confirmed before of God in the person of Christ. See, that's what it's really saying. That this covenant was confirmed of God, but in the person of Christ. And what covenant now is he talking about? The law. The law was a covenant. Just like the Abrahamic covenant was, the law, was a covenant. The Davidic covenant was a covenant. It was an agreement that God made and which he could never change or withdraw. It settled it forever because God made it. All right? And so this covenant, the law, which was 430 years after, in other words, after this promise to Abraham that out of him would come the seed, 430 years later, Israel is going to come out of Israel and re, uh, come out of Egypt and receive the law at Sinai. Now I got to stop here a minute because you see, here is one of the places in Scripture where the scoffer likes to scoff and say, "See, the Scripture contradicts itself." Here it says 430 years. In another place it says 400 years, and another place it says 490 years. Well, what's going on? Well, there's no contradiction. No contradiction. Acts chapter 7, verse 6. And Stephen here is rehearsing again the whole history of Israel, just like Paul does a little later on in the book of Acts. All right, now then you come down to verse 6. Stephen says, God spake on this wise, that his seed, that is the offspring of Abraham, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land and that they should bring them into bondage and treat them evil, not 430, but what? Now it's 400. Contradiction? No. It's just simply a benchmark of where they measure time. Now again, maybe I can put this on the board. I, I hope I can make a little sense because uh, I think it helps when people can see things on the blackboard and uh, the feedback we get from our audience seems to substantiate that. All right, now here we got the little old map that I like to draw, just uh, not to scale or anything like that, but here's your Dead Sea, the Sea of Galilee, the Mediterranean, and here goes the Euphrates River all the way out there. Down here, and on one side of the river or the other, I don't know, I think on the east, some Bible scholars say on the west, but anyhow, down here was Ur, where God first spoke to Abram and said, leave Ur and leave your family and uh, go to a land that I will show you, which, of course, is going to be Canaan. But he doesn't tell Abram where. All right, now it would seem that Abram is 50 years old when the Lord first spoke to him. 50 years old. And so he leaves Ur, and he migrates all the way up to the Euphrates Valley, up to this place in Syria called Haran. And there they stop, remember, until his father, who was not supposed to have left with him, but did. So they stopped at Haran until Terah dies. Then after Terah dies, Abram and Lot and Sarai are now ready to move down into the land of Canaan. All right, now we can pretty well figure out from Scripture that when he left Haran, he was 75. So 25 years after the promise, I will make of you a nation, and I will do this, and I will do that. 25 years have gone by, and still nothing has happened. No child. Now at the age of 75, with Terah off the scene, he brings him on down into Canaan. And now he's 75. Now when you start going back on the chronology of all this, the 430 years 
begins from the time that he left Haran, came down to Canaan until Moses led the children out in what we call the Exodus for a total of 430 years. Now then, the 400 years is from the time that Isaac was five and Ishmael is sent out into the wilderness. And that's up here yet. All right, so when Isaac is five and Ishmael is sent completely away from contact with him, from that point on, then it becomes 400 years until Moses leads the children out. So, contradiction? No. It's just a matter of a benchmark of time. Are you going to start from Haran, or are you going to start from when Isaac was five years old? 430 years from Haran, 400 from the time that Ishmael is sent out, and, and uh, Isaac becomes then the uh, prime object, I guess, of our affections, because everything is now going to revolve around him. All right, now verse 18. For if, for if the inheritance be of the law, that is the Mosaic law and the Mosaic system, if everything that is of our spiritual inheritance is concerned with the law, then it's no more based on what? Promise. But as we saw in the last program, what did God do with Abraham? Promise, promise, promise. I will, I will, I will. And the law couldn't fulfill any of those promises because all the law could do, remember, was to condemn Israel. It didn't fulfill any promises per se. And so if the law was going to do the job, then it's no more a promise. But God gave the covenant based on promise. Promise. In other words, when God said it, that settles it. And that's where we come in by faith. All right, now then verse 19 is the verse I really wanted to get into and, and spend some time. Wherefore, then serveth the law. If it's not part of the promises, and it's certainly not part of grace, well then what was the purpose? Why did God ever give the law to Israel in the first place? Because you know, God doesn't do anything without having a valid reason. And he did give the law for a reason, all right? So wherefore then serveth the law? It was added. Now you want to remember how many years of human history had transpired from the time of Adam until Moses received the law. Well, 2,500 years. 2,500 years mankind went without a written law. 2,000 years up to Abraham, another 500 years from Abraham, did I say? Yeah, 2,500 years. And then 2,000 to Abraham, and then another 500 between Abraham and the actual giving of the law. Well, we saw it was 430 years, but that's in round figures, 500 years. All right. It was added. It was brought in 2,500 years after the human race had begun because of what? Transgressions. Sin. Now let's go back and look how sin ran rampant. It's been a long time since we've been in Genesis on the program. We're teaching it in a couple of classes in Oklahoma again, but go back to Genesis <clears throat> chapter 6. And I always like to remind people that up until the law was given at Mount Sinai, 2,500 years after Adam was created, there was no system of worship. There was no organized religion, as we call it. There was no written, thou shalt and thou shalt not. And so, what happened? Well, here we have a good example. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Genesis chapter 6, dropping down to verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Can you and he found Abram, and he spoke to him and gave him these promises. All right, 
Then after Abram came out and was given all the promises, the I wills of chapter 12 and 15 and 17 and so forth, now then it comes to the place where God says, man has to understand what's right and what's wrong. He doesn't seem to get it. And so he gave the law. And he laid it down punctually. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, right off the bat, what did that fly in the face of? Everything that took place at Babel. Because Babel was the beginning of all the false worships. And so God comes right back. Number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And then he comes on through with the rest of the commandments. Now, remember, very few people understand this. Percentage-wise, it'd be way down. Romans chapter 3. Verse 19, Romans chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. This is, these are verses that very few people know is even in their Bible. And yet it says so much. Romans chapter 3, and remember what we just saw in Galatians, that the law was added because of sin. It did not take sin away from people, it merely showed them their sin. All right, now Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now Paul writes, we know, and the Greek word know is a full knowledge. We know that what things soever the law saith, that is the Ten Commandments in particular, it saith to them who are under the law. And who was that? Israel. Only Israel was put under the law. But the power of it, the convicting part of it, didn't stop with Israel. It went out to the whole human race. Next portion of the verse. And it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. And how much? All the world. Not just Israel. All the world is now made guilty before God. Now, you see, that's the exact opposite of what most people think is the function of the law. Most people think that the law was given to help people do right and do good, do the best they could, and God would somehow wink and say, yeah, you didn't do too bad, I'll let you in. That's not the purpose of the law. The law was given for only one purpose, and that was to show mankind how far they fell short of God's standard. Because no man has ever lived that could keep the Ten Commandments. It's impossible. And so it was given for that purpose alone. Now verse... Verse 19 again. Wherefore, then serveth the law? Or why was the law given? It was added because of transgressions until the seed should come, now watch the context again, now we're not talking about the nation of Israel, we're talking about the singular seed, the Christ. And so it was added because of transgressions until the Messiah or the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. In other words, this whole covenant promise made to Abraham was spiritual. It never left, left the hands of spiritual beings. And as it was given to Abraham, that's all it was, was something that was heavenly in its origin. And Abraham merely became the subject of it, but he couldn't touch it. He couldn't change it. And even though his offspring would break it and break it and break it, God kept it settled and he's never going to go back on it. And that's why we can say with all the confidence in the world, he's not through with Israel. He hasn't finished his covenant promises with them. If Israel would be, like most of Christendom says, off the board and of no more count in God's eyes, then all the covenants fall apart. You understand that? Then the covenants fall apart. And they won't because God is not through with Israel and he is still going to finish and fulfill those covenant 
promises. All right, now verse 20 almost says what I've been saying all along, that now a mediator, a go-between, is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Now, what do we mean? Well, if you're going to have a controversy between two people, and you bring in a mediator, and of course we're most aware of that, I guess, with labor unions and management, and so they can't get together on a contract. So what do they bring in? A mediator. Well, what's the purpose of the mediator? Well, to make a meeting of the mind, give here and give here, and then finally agree and sign a contract. All right, but God is not going to use a three-person mediation. God is a mediator and the instigator and the fulfiller, and he alone is involved. Even man can't touch those covenants. It's impossible. So that's what it means then, that God is one. I guess I could put it this way. He is the one and only involved in a covenant. He gives it, he carries it out, and he's going to complete it. And man has nothing to do with it. Okay, I guess we got time to go on to another verse. Verse 21. Good question, isn't it? Is the law then against the promises of God? If all these promises of Abraham were given without the law, and they were, remember, that was 500 years almost before the law was given, does the law come in and abrogate or cancel the promises? Why, no. It enhances them. See, now read on. Was the law then against the promise of God? Well, don't even think such a thing. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. You see what that says? That if it was possible for the law to give eternal life, and the potential was there, because, you see, all the demands of that holy God were in those Ten Commandments. And what I'm standing here and telling you is that if a human being could have kept all ten, would God have had to let him into his heaven? Well, sure. Sure. Because that's what it says. The law was perfect. And anybody that could fulfill it would now have met God's demands and he could say, come on into my heaven. But what's the problem with that? No person can do it. Nobody can keep those Ten Commandments other than Christ himself. Nobody. And so the law reverts right back to what we said it was before. It does nothing but condemn the whole human race. And again, verse 22, But the Scripture, the Word of God, as we've just shown you, has concluded all under sin. Jew and Gentile, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ, in other words, believing again in his death, shed blood, his burial, and his resurrection, that those who would believe that, that it might be given to them. What? Eternal life, salvation. And it's for nothing except believing the gospel. But it doesn't do any good to believe the gospel until you realize that you're lost. And see, here's, here's where it's so hard, especially for good people. They say, well, I'm not that bad. I'm pretty good. Well, yeah, they are. They're probably better than I am. But until they realize how lost they are spiritually, until they realize what the Scripture concludes, God can't save them. They are just without hope. And one day they're going to wake up and it's going to be too late. And it's sad. It's so sad. But God, as I've been stressing for the last several months, God has forgiven every sin. He has done everything that needs to be done. All right, now verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Oh, we got to explain something, don't we? Because you've heard me teach it, you've heard others teach it, that all the way back to Adam, what was the one criteria for salvation? For anybody. Faith. Faith. 
Faith began just as soon as God dealt with Adam and Eve after they had sinned. He had to take God at his word. All right, so what does this mean, before faith came? Well, without doing any violence to Scripture, and I hope it can enhance it, after the word faith, I like to put W-A-Y. And I think that helps. Before the faith way came, we were kept under the law. Now, what do I mean by that? Because of what I'm always teaching. We're not under law. We're under grace. And grace says, keep the law. No, grace says, by faith. And faith alone. Plus nothing. So all these things were afterwards, after that period of law, which was from 1500 B.C. until Paul comes along at about 37 or 38 A.D. And all that time there was nothing of faith plus nothing. It was all under the law. All right, now let's move on to verse 24. Wherefore, looking at the fact that now grace has been revealed... But, oh, another verse comes to mind. Come back. Wherefore, because of how God is dealing on a progressive revelation, <clears throat> wherefore, the law. Now, I know you have to be careful when you read your Bible. Sometimes the law speaks of that whole system of Judaism. The ceremonial law, the civil law, and... Uh, the moral law. Sometimes that's all lopped into one word. But here, I think the Apostle Paul is making reference only to the moral law. The Ten Commandments are now referred to here as the law. <coughs> Verse 24, reading on. Wherefore, the law, the Ten Commandments, was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Ooh. And what does that mean? Well, for 1,500 years, Israel was under the law. And it was a system by which God was training them and teaching them and hopefully bringing them to the place where they would be mature, understanding, believing Jews. That's what God was hoping for. Didn't happen, but that's what he was striving for. And so that was the purpose of the law, to prepare the nation of Israel for a great opportunity, to be vessels, to be instruments that he could use to bring in the masses of the Gentile world. All right? So even for themselves, as a nation, the law was a schoolmaster to bring them to the place where they could be justified, now not by law-keeping, but by what? Faith. See? Faith. Now, you want to remember that all the way up since Exodus chapter 20, Israel was under the law, and of course it was still the operation of faith that brought an individual Jew into a right relationship with God, but it was law and faith, and there was no such thing as faith plus nothing, as I teach, until after the law was totally totally satisfied at the cross. And when Christ died, he satisfied the demands of the law in my place and yours. And so Israel for 1,500 years was under this law to bring them to the place where they, I think it's probably a reference, where they could have believed who Jesus was. Because all through the Old Testament, the prophecies were looking forward to the coming of their Redeemer and their King and their Messiah. They should have, as you've heard me say a hundred times, they should have known who He was. They could have known who He was. The Old Testament was full of it. But why didn't they? Hey, they were steeped in, come on, you Saturday night people, what? Unbelief, that's right.